Before we start exploring the rings of Saturn, I'd like to give a shout out to the out of this world flavor of Magic Spoon, who's sponsoring today's video. If you're a blue skeleton like I am, you yearn for the fun Saturday morning cereal memories of your youth and would like to recapture that same feeling but with more protein, less sugar, and four to five net grams of carbs per serving. Well, Magic Spoon does just that. While I personally love blueberry muffin that comes in this cute box here, I gotta say I'm really excited for the birthday cake flavor, which it's on its way to my door literally as we speak. Some of you may know I am a big cereal fan, so Magic Spoon has been a great choice for my midnight snacking urges. And they've been really supportive of the show, so if you'd like $5 off the cereal bundle of your choice, enter the code MCMUSCLES at checkout, scan the QR code you see on your screen right here, or go to magicspoon.com slash McMuscles to snag some of that birthday cake before it's gone. Now, without further ado, let's start the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of What Happened, the show that takes an analytical eye to games and media with absolutely divine development struggles. And when you're coming hot off the heels of a very successful video game console like the Genesis slash Mega Drive, well you better believe you'll struggle to reach those same lofty heights, even if you're named after the sixth planet from the sun. So grab your space helmets and a 4 mega expansion cart and get ready to blast off as I answer the question, what happened? to the Sega Saturn. When telling the story of a console's entire lifespan, it behooves one to rewind just a little bit before that, and Sega was in a pretty weird place circa 1993. Well, the Genesis slash Mega Drive, okay, I'm just saying the Genesis from now on, okay, sorry, had been a worldwide hit, and the Sega CD had been a novel diversion, things took a, let's just say it, a very wrong turn with the 32X. The ill-fated accessory was created to take on new competition that was hitting the marketplace, specifically the fearsome Atari Jaguar. The mushroom-shaped peripheral did have a surprisingly decent launch though, selling almost 500,000 units throughout the holiday season, but that petered off quickly due to lackluster support, as only 40 games were ever released for it. It really only hurt Sega in the end though, as they had to slash the cost of the device dramatically within a year to liquidate all stock before its official discontinuation, and not to mention all the loyal customers who felt shortchanged. While the order to release some type of technology to combat encroaching rivals came from Sega of Japan, it was Sega of America's responsibility to make it all happen, and while they were busy with that toilet fire, the true follow-up to the Genesis was being designed. Before and during all of this, Sony had approached Sega of America on the possibility of doing a collab on a new next-gen system system only a short while after Nintendo had backed out of more or less the same concept. Sega of America leadership was hyped as hell over the possibilities, so why didn't this happen then? Well, according to former Sega USA CEO Tom Kalinske in a story on GameIndustry.biz, one of the key reasons why I left Sega is when we had the opportunity to work with Sony. Sony leadership and I had agreed we were going to do one platform, share the development cost of it, share the problem loss for a couple of years on it, but each benefit from the software we could bring to that platform. We go to Sega and the board turned it down, which I thought was the stupidest decision ever made in the history of business. And so Sega continued charting their course towards Saturn, while Sony swore to never entrust their heart to another and finally decided to go at it alone. Let's get into the tech. In terms of design philosophy, the Saturn seemed to have been built with dueling ideologies at play, trying to balance between the old and the new, but not dedicating itself 100% to either thing. Obviously, being able to handle the majority of Sega's latest 3D arcade hits was a priority, but when the Saturn was being designed throughout 1993 and into 94, 2D was still king, so Sega most likely wanted some flexibility between the 
it too. They found that flexibility with two graphics processing units, each with their own dedicated video RAM, which had their own unique responsibilities. If this sounds really similar to how the guts of the Jaguar worked, well, that's because they are really similar. H hell, that's basically how the 32X worked. These two chips were known as VDP-1 and VDP-2, with the first usually being responsible for handling pretty much all on-screen actors and objects, sprites, polygons, all that important stuff. While it wasn't a ginormous triangle-pushing powerhouse, it could scale, move, and rotate 2D art without breaking a sweat, so it was, for lack of a better term, a pretty robust GPU. So you know how the Saturn's library is remembered for its many 2D titles with impressive sprite work? Well, this is all down to VDP-1. VDP-2 was no slouch either, but it was most often used as a background generator and was rumored to have been included into the Saturn fairly late in development, because it was probably and correctly predicted that VDP-1 couldn't do absolutely everything by itself. Of course, the idea here was that when both GPUs were used in tandem, they could produce some very nice looking visuals, but developers would need to get creative to achieve them, and that included Sega themselves. As a quick example, while the arcade version of Virtua Fighter 2 had gorgeous 3D stages, the Saturn had to approximate them by pushing around a lot of 2D assets in the background, and the same went for Last Bronx, although that saw better results. These two examples are of course pretty much best case scenarios where the changes are negligible to the point that some might not even notice them. However, this did lead to many multi-platform games having to go through some pretty serious compromises to get up and running, or even to release at all. Hell, just the amount of games I've covered on this very show that had their Saturn versions cancelled well before release? Well, it's like way more than a few, which is way too much. So while it was just powerful and versatile enough to get most things working, but it often required workarounds and extra time to suss out the nuances of the architecture, which became harder and harder for publishers to justify porting to it. Of course, all of this was exacerbated by where the industry was heading in general, which unfortunately for the Saturn was directly towards uh, 3Dville. Once Sony started touting the cutting edge polygon pushing power of the PlayStation, an eventual detail started leaking about the Nintendo Ultra 64's hardware, the majority majority of big studios started chasing the 3D dream, which you can't really blame them for. 3D is the future, fuck you, Symphony of the Night. This was something that was completely out of Sega's hands though, but like all other consoles I've covered in the past, the problems with the Saturn weren't just relegated to a single massive mistake. Oh no, Sega made lots of their own, with arguably the biggest one being the Saturn's ill-conceived Western launch. While it's been a lot of doom and gloom so far, when the Saturn released in Japan in November of 1994, it sold around 500,000 units in just about 30 days. Virtua Fighter was incredibly popular in Japan at that time, so it absolutely was the killer app, despite the port being less than arcade perfect and with no extra features added. Sega then announced that the Western launch would be in fall of 1995, almost a whole year later, but it would do so with a far meatier library of roughly 20 games. However, and this is a big however, Hayao Nakayama, CEO of Sega at the time, was starting to get a bit antsy, as the PlayStation was very rapidly catching up to the Saturn's Japanese sales numbers, despite having enjoyed a two-week lead. Not willing to give Sony the same opportunity to catch up in the rest of the world, he mandated that the Western launch had to be moved up almost five whole months, May in America and July for Europe, while the PlayStation was still scheduled for that September. Sega of America CEO Tom Kalinske strongly advised against this move as it meant launching with very little software, amongst a myriad of other logistical problems, but Nakayama remained steadfast. According to Tom's account in the book Console Wars, Sega, Nintendo, and the Battle That Defined a Generation, it was clear to him that despite being CEO of Sega of America, it wasn't a decision he was allowed to participate in. So then, at E3, 
3, 1995, the very first one, Tom Kalinske took the stage after a Saturn software demonstration and literally shadow dropped the whole console, saying that the Saturn had shipped yesterday and was now available across North America at some major retailers for 399 US dollars, which it's safe to say blindsided the entire industry. Now, while that could easily be considered a mic drop, what happened next was a mic orbital strike. That very same E3, Steve Race, Sony Computer Entertainment America's CEO, walked up to that same podium and simply said, $299 and swagged off the stage, his giant balls clattering between his legs. So yeah, the Saturn would debut first, but the PlayStation was going to be $100 cheaper, have a bigger launch lineup, and a ton more hype leading up to it. Cause, you know, they didn't decide to suddenly release it on a whim. Sega of America had to do the best with the hand they were dealt, and thus the Saturn launched with six games. Clockwork Knight, Daytona USA, Panzer Dragoon, Pebble Beach Golf, Links, Virtual Fighter, and Worldwide Soccer Sega International Victory Goal Edition. Well, not a terrible bunch, it wasn't the best bunch either. Daytona USA and Virtual Fighter were bare bones. Panzer Dragoon could be beaten in under two hours, Clockwork Knight was uh, Clockwork Knight, and two sports titles that were worlds away from the NFL and NHL smash hits that typified the Genesis. This wasn't the only issue though, as moving up the Saturn's launch ruffled many the third-party Feather, who found out about the Saturn's moved-up release the same time as everyone else. It also pissed off other retailers who were not given any stock in lieu of favoring the bigger chains, since they were under such a sudden and tight deadline. And when the Saturn was finally available to them, some chose to not even carry it at all. The ripple effects of this snap decision go even further than that, because so many developers were caught so unawares between May and the original Saturn launch launch month of September, only two, two games were released, that being Bug and uh, Street Fighter the Movie. I couldn't make this up if I tried. A steady stream of games did eventually emerge as the original September release came into view, but by that time, everyone was talking about the PlayStation. There was also another big elephant in the room, or, or not in the room in this case. During the Saturn's launch, well, it's first year, hell, its entire life cycle, really, it was missing something, something kind of important, namely Sega's speedy blue animal mascot, Echo the Dolphin. There wasn't a single 3D mainline Echo game ever released for it, resulting in millions of dollars in lost sales and many, many unhappy fans. <laughs> uh, no, seriously though, check out my Sonic Extreme video because that's its own absolutely bonkers thing. And while it's nice the blue blur got some representation on the Saturn with Sonic R, Sonic 3D Blast, and to a lesser extent Sonic Jam, most fans knew these games weren't the big, turgid 3D Sonic experience they were hoping for, so they didn't move the needle all that much. It can't be overstated how much of a massive fumble this was on Sega's part, as Sonic had been a huge element of the Jenny's success. It was just about a year into the Saturn's global debut that Tom Kalinske, who Nakayama had hired himself to beat Nintendo in the West, started to see his power and influence suddenly diminish. In a December 2022 interview with Time Extension, he explained, Explained. The situation did change dramatically. It went from where I was able to do whatever basically I wanted to, to all of a sudden I was being dictated to. And I really, at the time, didn't understand why this was occurring. We'd been so successful, so I didn't understand why all of a sudden decisions were being forced on me from Japan, even to the degree of all the stuff I've talked about before on the Saturn and where I was forced to introduce it. We didn't have enough hardware, we didn't have enough software, and then to make matters worse, we were forced to introduce it five months earlier than we wanted. Well, we didn't want to introduce it anyway. See, Sega of America had reportedly spoken against pushing the Saturn several times to their bosses in Japan, saying it was underpowered and that relying too heavily on arcade ports would eventually turn into a detriment, but these warnings fell upon deaf ears. So in June of 1996, Tom stepped down from his position as the CEO of Sega of America, along with co-chairman 
German David Rosen, with Sega then bringing in Bernie Stoller, who they had just lured away from Sony as their new executive vice president in charge of product development and third-party relations. During this process, Sega of America's autonomy was also greatly reduced. Projects like Eternal Champions 3 were cancelled, and they would no longer be able to greenlight any games without approval from Japan, which of course would result in less games being published overall. So, for those keeping track, it was only one year and some change into the Saturn's Western launch, and Sega of America's upper management had already seen two high-profile exits, which should give you an idea of how things were going, and unfortunately, where they were headed. During his tenure at Sony, Bernie Stoller was known for electing against bringing over a number of Japanese titles, a tradition which he proudly continued over at Sega. According to some lists, and this might not be 100% accurate, all told there's 1,046 games released for the Saturn over its lifetime, with 785 of those, which is just shy of 75%, having never been brought outside of Japan. Now, of course, a fair number of these probably probably wouldn't have done that well outside of the country, but that's still a staggering amount of content left unlocalized. And you thought Reggie's tenure during the Wii era was rough. Now, I know I've been focusing a lot on how badly the Saturn was faring in the West, so it's only fair to mention that in its native Japan, it never struggled. Oh no, it actually thrived. Arcades remained popular in Japan all throughout the mid to late 90s, in contrast to the stark drop-off they saw in the rest of the world. So the Saturn saw the benefits of quick arcade conversions, along with many quality JRPGs, or actually just RPGs in this case. So it should be no surprise where the Saturn moved the bulk of its 9 million worldwide tally, selling almost 6 million of those consoles in Japan, which beat the likes of the N64, GameCube, Wii U, Xbox 360, and damn, even the Mega Drive and Dreamcast. The Saturn's catalog of games also had its own unique appeal, especially to those who weren't really into the first few years of clunky 3D that the PlayStation and N64 hosted. Dragon Force, Astal, Legend of Oasis, Guardian Heroes, and some incredibly accurate Capcom fighting game conversions with the use of the 4 Meg expansion cart, which produced better visuals and animation than their PlayStation counterparts. But as nice as those small Ws were, the problem was that magazines and just playground word of mouth weren't really a buzzin about Dragon Force or Guardian Heroes. They were gabbing about GoldenEye, Final Fantasy VII, and Metal Gear Solid. While Virtua Fighter 2 would top the Saturn charts in Japan with over 1.7 million copies sold, Sega would sadly never manage to secure that killer app it so desperately needed outside of Japan. Even a price drop to $199 did not help matters much, and by 1997, there were signs that Sega themselves were already giving up on the Saturn, at least in the West. Bernie Stoller himself was not a fan of the console, claiming it was poorly designed and even going so far as to say, at E3 1997, that the Saturn was not their future. I mean, hey, it's great to acknowledge when things aren't going so hot, but just like saying that raw and in public, like who, who let this man cook? 1997 also marked another major turn of events, Sega and Bandai's failed attempt at a fusion dance. Since both companies were starting to fall upon hard times, they felt combining their resources and brands would net them never before seen profits. This obviously did not happen because at the 11th hour, it came to light that many staffers in middle management had been strongly against the merger, and the opposition then grew so fast and so loud that Bandai just pulled out. This failure then caused their CEO slash nepotism baby, who inherited the company from his dad, Makoto Yamashina, to quit altogether, taking most of the responsibility for the merger collapsing. In a post-failed merger statement, Sega's CEO Nakayama said, we will not be successful working together if Bandai's management cannot take a hold of people's hearts. Damn, that's some real ass shit right there. But then Nakayama also stepped down from his position as CEO, mainly due to his part in the failed merger, all his recent really bad decisions, and finally, the 
really terrible 1997 that Sega had, so he was out the door by January of 1998. While not every merger throughout history has been an unmitigated success, it's easy to see how access to way more staff and Bandai licensed brands could have really benefited Sega in the long run. As we move into 1998 though, we move into an incredibly tough time if you were a Saturn fan living outside of Japan. During the entirety of that 12 month period, there were only 7 new Saturn games released. 7! Granted, they weren't really anything to scoff at. Burning Rangers, Winter Heat, The House of the Dead, Magic Knight Ray Earth, Shining Force 3, NHL 98, and Panzer Dragoon Saga. But can you imagine your, your platform of choice getting barely more than a half dozen games per year? Uh, well, I guess Wii U owners could. Hey y'all, Scott here. Obviously, this reduction in releases was mostly down to Sega diverting their teams onto the Dreamcast, which I've covered before, but this meant that from November of 1998 to September of 1999, Sega released no games for any console in North America, which most likely caused a decent chunk of fans to seek their gaming fix elsewhere. Meanwhile, in Japan, the Saturn continued on its merry way for two more years, seeing support from Sega until its final release in March of 2000, which actually hurts my head a little bit. When I think of the Saturn, I imagine it just vanishing off the face of the Earth the second the Dreamcast was announced, which goes to show just how different the situation was in its home country. I think, when looking back on the complicated relationship between Sega of America and their home branch, it's clear there was a lot of finger pointing, but after going through all the facts, I can't help but feel that the US branch got the short end of the stick here. This was a really tumultuous time for the industry in general, with several other high-profile consoles failing to gain much traction. But fortunately for the Saturn, it's the most successful of that bunch, and easily the most fondly remembered. Nowadays, the console and its back catalog is highly desirable amongst collectors, as it's teeming with underrated gems worth seeking out, especially the ones that never left Japan. Like my precious Final Fight Revenge. Ah. <sighs> If you know of any other games, consoles, or whatever that absolutely went through it, let me know in the comments below, or give me a shout over on my Twitter. See you next time, and thanks for watching!